Welcome ladies and gentlemen. Today's video is about how I made my Bridgerton inspired Regency dress. This was also the first time for me that I made something historically inspired. But as you may have noticed, I didn't really stuck to the historical accuracy and decided to add a more whimsical and fantasy-like flair to my gown. For this I decided to follow a pattern I bought and not make one myself. So I link down below which one I use so you can find it and make your own Regency dress. This project was really an impulse project. I didn't know what came over me normally. I wouldn't do something from a show that mightly interests me, but the hype got to me, so <laughs> I decided to make a Regency dress. Well, um, it was really great, it was an awesome experience. I learned a lot about dressmaking and learned a lot of uh, different kind of hand stitches while doing this. And yes, so it was totally a win. But you know, when it comes to Regency gowns, I really, really don't like them. <laughs> because have you seen this Empire race? It does nothing for your figure, just hangs down like a potato sack. <laughs> like, you can't even call this a waste. And also, I don't like puffy sleeves. I know a lot of you may gasp in shock and be outraged about this confession, but yes, puffy sleeves aren't really for me, so... I did them anyway, but at which cost? I think with my dress I managed to pull off something between the Bridgertons and the Featheringtons family because the Bridgertons are more elegant and have these more neutral colors and the Bridgertons go way more into the floral things and they are like all over the top so I took uh, the basic colors and found a beautiful ivory satin and used a floral embroidered tool over that and I think the outcome is so magical and I love it. So here's how I did my Regency gown. Enjoy the video. The journey of making this dress starts where every journey of dressmaking starts. Not with cutting out the pattern, but with making a mock-up first. This is really important, always remember that. Because when I made the mock-up, I found out that it was quite too big for me and I had to size it down. And I also noticed that I had to make some adjustments to the yokes because I made the Regency short stays first I'm wearing underneath and those straps from the stays were showing in the back so I had to make the cutout in the back a little smaller so the straps of my Regency stays were covered. Then after a time it felt like forever all my fabrics had arrived and I could cut out my pattern. Here you can see almost all of the pattern pieces laid together. What's missing is of course the skirt. It is always a struggle to cut out such large pieces like the skirt, my teeny tiny apartment, but I managed somehow. And here I tried to record it, this other skirt piece, but my camera said nope, not today. Before I could finally pick up a needle, I had to transfer all my markings to my fabric pieces. Maybe it wasn't the best idea to use a pencil here because uh, the markings are still showing because I'm way too afraid to just throw my dress in the washing machine. So I would recommend you use some chalk or something like that. Then I took the lining and the underlining and put them together and I really should have given the underlay layer a good press beforehand. I used it for my mock-up first so there are some really mean wrinkles in there. By the way, this is the front piece of the bodice I'm working on right now. And here I'm pinning the layers together and then basting through them. So they won't shift while I'm working with them. And this is only one of two times I'm doing the basting stitches by hand because 
this is really time consuming and I'm not that much into hand stitching. <laughs> but I must say those stitches are way more easy to remove than the stitches I can make with my sewing machine because they are still really tiny even when I'm using the widest stitch uh, that's available on my machine. Here I'm basting through all the symbols and lines of construction I marked on my fabric earlier and leaving the ends of the threads loose so I can remove them easier later. Then it was time to make the pleats. I used the threads I stitched in place earlier as a guide and folded the fabric. Then I pinned it all down and gave it a good press with my iron. This is how the bodice front looked like so far. Then it was time to prepare the overlay. I did that by gathering the upper and lower edge of the overlay and then placing it on top of my underlining and lining. After I adjusted all the gathers, I could baste all the layers together once more. Then I noticed some dust and tiny parts of thread had slipped between my layers, but I noticed it in time before I sewed everything close and could remove them easily. So this is how the bodice front looked so far. Then it was time to work on the back and side pieces by sewing them together first for each individual layer. And yeah, then I regretted that I took my mock-up apart so thoroughly, thoroughly, completely took it apart. Oh. English is my friend today. But what I was trying to say is that I had already sewn this together for my mock-up version and took it apart before I started my new project. Well, I regret that a little, but sewing them together was an easy enough job. So, it's okay. I repeated that step with the back and side pieces of my satin fabric and yeah, well, then I could lay them together, wrong sides facing each other it took me a little figured out the right way. Then you can guess what came next. Yep, basting the raw edges along the seam lines and the folding line in the back. These are both of my back pieces right now, but they aren't complete without the overlay layer. So I removed the pattern from that and transferred my marking onto the fabric. Then I repeated the steps I already did with the front part. I gathered the upper and lower edge of my overlay fabric. Then I could lay it on top of the lining, adjust the gathers and baste everything together. Then finally the front and the back pieces were ready to be sewn together. Now you can see that this is going somewhere. <laughs> Then it was time to make some self-made bias tape. You do that by cutting out a shape like this out of your fabric and then sewing it together in this really weird way and make sure to use some straight stitches. You can see just how bright the afternoon sun was that day by how much it's reflecting on my satin fabric. But anyway, your markings on your fabric should match like this. Pretty. Then you can start cutting along those lines and making this wonderful continuous bias tape. It was so incredibly long but I ended up making some more later because it wasn't enough for the stress. The next step was to cut the bias tape in stripes that had the length of the upper edges of each bodice front and back section. Then with right sides together I pinned the bias tape on, um, having the upper raw edges even, and then stitching along the seam line. After stitching everything in place I had to turn the bias sections up and give it a good press with my iron. It probably was then that I burned some small holes into my overlay fabric. I could hide that pretty well because it was also on the bag and nobody will ever see that. 
After covering up all my mistakes, I pinned on the casing to the bias tape, with center front and center back edges of the casing turned inside. Then I sewed along the seam line again. I trimmed away the excess fabric and then I could turn the casing sections to the inside over the seam. And then I slip stitched this all in place by hand. This is a great thing to do while you're listening to your online lectures. Online university has some advantages, I have to say. Up next were the yokes. You know the procedure by now. You have to first sew the front and back yoke of each individual layer together first and base all the layers together. I also added bias binding to my yokes by pinning right sides together on the inner edge of each front and back yoke section. Now the bodice and the yokes looked somewhat like this. Here you can see how I struggled with doing all the slip stitches by hand while listening to one of my online lectures. Sewing by hand does have something quite relaxing, but well, I just can't do much of it. Considering that I just figured out how to do slip stitches and that this was my first time doing that, the outcome is really satisfying. And also I advise you to admire your own work from time to time. It's an important part of the process, trust me. With all the casings and binding added, the bodice and the yolks look like this. And here's also a photo of the inside of the construction because I think this is where all the secrets are really hidden and revealed. I continued with making the ribbons, which I inserted through the casings I made before. I burned the edges using lighter to melt the fabric to keep it from fraying, but be very careful when you're doing that. Then I threaded a safety pin through the ribbon and used this to help me threading the ribbon through the casing. Then I basted the ends of the ribbon securely at the armhole edges. Then I could finally pin the yokes to the upper edge of the bodice front and bodice back, matching the seam lines and all the markings I made beforehand. Then I basted along the seam line. After that I had to sew on the yokes by hand using a slip stitch. The next part I was working on were the sleeves. I first gathered the lower and upper edges of the sleeve and then my camera said goodbye once more. But now you got a pretty good look of my tattoo. Props to those who recognize it. Write in the comments what you think it is. So where was I? Right, the sleeves. After stitching the sleeve seams together, I added a cuff. Therefore, I stitched the sleeve binding together first and then pinned it to my sleeve. Then I adjusted the gathers once more, you know the steps, basted all the layers together and then stitched everything in place. Just kidding, I didn't do the basting stitches, I just stitched everything in place right after I pinned it down. I'm lazy, okay? Please don't judge me. Now I could turn the cuff outside and over the edge and I had to sew it down by hand using slip stitches once more. But I left that for the next day because I had an online lecture then again and decided to sew the sleeves to the bodice first. This was really embarrassing, seriously, I did sew the first sleeve on wrong the first time. So I had to rip all the stitches and sew it on again. And then you can see once more how not to do it. Here's the moment I realized I messed up again. But this time I noticed it before I sewed the sleeve on, so I could still save it. But this was the moment where I really questioned all my life decisions and wasn't so sure if I even wanted to go on with this dress. You see this moment of silence, of pure desperation there? Well. <laughs> It really felt how it looked. Then I had to just take out all those million pins again, but at least the gathers were adjusted quite nicely already, so that's a positive thing I guess. God, it was so late already and I just wanted to go to bed, but I just couldn't leave this unfinished. Good news are that the bodice is now finished and I could start working on the skirt. 
Here you can see the only place in my flat that is barely big enough so I can place the skirt pieces onto the floor. The rest is just my bed and my couch where a carpet is tucked underneath so I can just get rid of the carpet and roll it up and put it into a corner. And yeah, also my huge desk which is a total mess so I couldn't walk on that either. <laughs> But yes, I could make do with this. So what I did was I made sure that I transferred all the markings from the pattern onto the fabric and laid the front and the back piece on top of each other with wrong sides together and pinning them together with pins. I used French seams to sew the skirt pieces together. I first had to figure out what that meant but it's basically that you're putting the layers with wrong sides together first and then you sew along the seam lines which I marked here. Then you turn that inside out and sew along the edges once more while encasing the raw edges. And this ladies and gentlemen was the moment I thought that I broke my needle. <laughs> this picture is a picture of pure panic. But don't worry, my needle survived hitting the pin and I could continue sewing my wonderful French seam. So here I turned one layer of my skirt inside out and gave it a good press with my iron. Then I sewed along the seam line again, encasing the raw edges in between and that created a wonderful seam with no raw edges at all. You can see how clean and beautiful it looks. Then of course I had to repeat this process with all my other layers, meaning my embroidered tool and my cotton for my mock-up. We are slowly getting near towards finishing this dress, but first we have to pin all the layers of the skirt together, basting the upper edges together so the layers won't shift so much, and then reinforcing the back opening with small stitches along the lines, as you can see here. Once I've done that, I had to slash between the stitching, which was quite terrifying, because when you get to the end of your slash, you have to be very very careful not to cut those stitches you just did. To hem the back opening edges I had to turn in the raw edges and press them as you can see right now. Then I trimmed very close to the stitching to get rid of this excess fabric and I turned in those edges again and sewed them in place. Afterwards I had to gather the skirt between the side seams and back opening edges and the front. Then I could pin the skirt and bodice with right sides together, not like I did here, because why would I ever learn my lesson and do it the right way from the beginning? So you're supposed to pin the bodice with the wrong side facing the skirt. But no, I did the right steps anyway. You have to match your markings and then you can adjust the gathers in the skirt. I gathered the skirt with my machine first, but all those layers were just so thick that it was really hard to adjust the gathers by hand later. So unfortunately my thread broke and I stitched everything with my hand again. After I overcame all those struggles, I could finally sew the bodice and the skirt together. Those are six layers my needle had to go through. With all those gathered fabric, it was really hard to find all the needles again. I did miss one or two at first. But look how pretty it already looks being all sewed together, but well, we are still not finished. Once more I had to form a casing for a ribbon, this time along the waist seam. Therefore I placed a ribbon to the waist seam allowance, placing the lower edge of the ribbon along the stitching and turning under ends at the back opening edge. I stitched along the lower edge of the ribbon with machine and then I turned up the bodice as well as the ribbon and then I had to stitch it by hand using a prick stitch through all the layers of the dress. It was fun, maybe. 
After the casing was complete, I once again used a safety pin to help me insert the ribbon in the casing. And for no reason at all, I just had to make some cute little bows. And no one can stop me from doing that. And I was already so close to being done with this dress. I only had to sew on some hooks and eyes to the casing and ribbon at the back opening edges. I also still needed to hem the skirt. I didn't show it because it's just folding over the edges and stitching them in place. Now this is me trying on the finished dress for the first time. And I really felt like a princess already. A few days later a friend accompanied me to the botanical garden of our city and she took some wonderful pictures of me there. Fun story, we also met a few people who were really interested in what we were doing and they showered me in compliments and it was really so nice of them. Also they told me they first thought I was wearing a wedding dress. Okay, just to clarify, if I ever were to wear it, I wouldn't wear a dress styled like this because as I said in the beginning of this video, this empire waist isn't my cup of tea. Now we are almost at the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching till the end. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider giving a thumbs up and leaving a subscription. Now please enjoy the rest of this whimsical videos we took at the Botanical Garden. And I hope to see you soon in my next video. Bye!